Welcome everyone, it's great to see you all. And it is terrific to be working with Gary Wong again. Uh, for those of you who were not able to participate back in June, we had Gary on a podcast. And uh, I, I will say this, and he, by the way, Gary has come all the way from London for this, so thank you uh, and hope everyone enjoys it. But obviously this is a very uh, newfangled and somewhat complex topic, and I think what Gary will do an excellent job of this evening is demystifying this. Um, I do want to encourage any of you who have questions to feel free during the presentation to uh, pose those questions. I, I, I see BJ there. I think you have the mic. We'll uh, walk around. So, okay, let's get to it. Uh, Gary, during the June podcast, you did an outstanding job of broadly outlining and concisely describing artificial intelligence, machine language, and now casting. So what I would ask you to do first to set the stage for your conversation on large language models, models LLMs. From this point forward, we're going to use acronyms, okay? So AI, ML for machine language, and LLM for that, okay? Uh, Gary, give us a high-level view of AI, ML, and LLMs, high level, before we dive into the specifics of LLM, if you don't mind. Well, thank you, Bob. Uh, everyone can hear me. Thanks. Yes. Right. So, let me start with something, you know, it is a bit dry to start with definition. So, let me start with some contrast to what we understand first. Software engineer. We write computer codes. So, let's start with the the starting point. And actually, um, so actually, I'm sorry, let me move back one step. What is the objective of this of the, the five side chant this evening? So, first of all, everyone's talking about AI, but it means different things to different people. So, so the idea for this five side chat is to make this AI more accessible to you, and then we can benefit from it and monetize it. So I'm not going to impose a definition, but I'm going to describe and contrast it with something that is start from a, a common starting point, software engineering. And you can see the code. So, so can I ask you something? You're, you're going to compare and contrast software engineering, which many of us are familiar with, with artificial intelligence. That's right. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Please. Thanks. So, I'm going to focus on the practical aspects, on the business, business impact, and so on. Now, I'd like to highlight one key feature that distinguishes AI, the new economy, from software engineering automation, which is the current economy. Now, which, but, so software engineering, basically, we are telling the computer what to do and how to do it, step by step. This is a very manual intensive process. We need to figure out the whole thing, program it, and so on. And we have to anticipate every single thing it's going to encounter and program them in. Otherwise, it will crash. In contrast, machine learning and AI, we are telling the computer what we want. And we feed the data into, and train the AI tools, meaning that AI tool will adjust its internal parameters until it gives us its desired outputs for our objectives. It seems a little bit uh, subtle definition, but it has some major consequences for business and the business model and the economy, how we operate. The, the former, the software engineering, works really well in static or tidy control environment. The system is highly optimized and efficient. Whereas when you, we are faced with a rapidly changing environment, and we, do, we need to constantly adapt and change our uh, to change our business approach and the operations, then the software engineering becomes very cumbersome because we have to keep changing it 
step by steps. And when we make changes, we have to see, well, is it contradict to the other part? Whereas in the, um, the AI system, it's going to be much more flexible to adapt to changing objectives and get to the result faster and cheaper. So it is not about a monolithic, in practice, it is not about a monolithic AI brain with sci-fi ability to, very, to do a very complex stuff. In practice, if you want to apply it in business, it's more about having a localized AI processes with simple adapt adaptability that make it work together, like a group of mini human with some common sense. So that is the much more practical way to make use of AI. You know, Gary, you gave us that definition. And I, I'm having this terrible memory. I took a computer science course when I was in college decades ago, and we were coding in Fortran. And I remember spending hours and hours in the, in the computer science lab because my inputs weren't correct. And it would spit out. Okay, so I, it, it, the deck was this thick, right? And if, if you make one mistake, it's all wrong. So what you're saying is, in the new world, that's not going to be the case. AI allows for uh, our, let's say, um, uh, insufficiencies to a certain degree. In a certain way, it automates the thinking process. It doesn't replace us replace us, but a lot of, let's say if we design a, a system with a full process, right. we have to figure out what are the functions, how we do it, put them together, as I mentioned, it's step by step, writing the codes, and you have to anticipate all the different situations yes. you would encounter, whereas in AI, it, you can actually delegate some of these tasks to the AI tools in the computer. Okay. So... That brings us to chat GBT and LLMs. Talk about that for a second. Yep, thanks. Now, if you imagine pre chat GDP, there is still a lot of research going on in AI and machine learning, but they are very specialist subjects. People have to have a very, um, you and me doesn't easily assess AI. So we, we heard about it, we can see all well. Netflix is using it, Amazon is using it, but it is very remote from us. ChatGDP, where, when it comes out, suddenly it allowed us to assess AI in a much more uh, accessible way. So, first of all, uh, let me talk about large language model uh, to, to define it. And it's ChatGDP is one such uh, LLM model. Right. It is a type of AI model that uses machine learning built on billions of parameters to understand and produce text. And that's all it does. It says large language model. So we learn from the internet, from the text, Google, PDF, look at all the patterns and adjust the internal parameters and produce text. That is what it does. So so now having this ChatGDP or LLM, it becomes a natural and accessible interface for non-specialists <coughs> to assess AI. And that is the big difference. It, it, it now it becomes uh, accessible to many people. So a lot of people see LLMs, ChatGBT in particular, uh, as a bit of a panacea. I'll give you an example. My, my daughter recently got married and I consulted with ChatGBT on a wedding speech. And it, was, it was a terrific wedding speech, if I don't mind saying so myself, right? Uh, but on a more serious note, if you consult with an LLM on a more serious matter, shouldn't we have concerns about confidentiality and about uh, the source taking our data, our information, and using it for purposes that we're not, or they're not permission to, or at least I don't think they're permission to. Yes. What do you think about that? Totally. Um, well, actually, when I arrived at the building, the security guard was 
where I was saying, oh, can you show me I'm going to AI conference? And the security guard said, oh, I'm getting married. I'm going to yes, use ChatGDC to write my wedding speech. <laughs> right, so it is... Um, so, so it's good for writing papers, poetry. What else can it do? Right. Now, one thing to understand is that ChatGDP is... There's no knowledge base behind it. It looked at the, it learned from all the language patterns and the text from the web. And it, when it is constructing the reply or an answer, it chooses the best word to try to fit into the, the answers. And because it doesn't want to be stumped, if it doesn't find the exact fit of your question or the answers, it introduces a certain probability element then. So, when you answer the question, what is up, uh, let's say in the middle of a sentence, you will look for the next best word to fit in to that. Okay. Instead of an exact word, it use probability and say, okay, over the several words that can fit in, but this word is the best fit. So as a result, uh, the, when you ask uh, ChatGDP uh, the same question five times, right. it probably produces slightly different answer every single time, which is fine if you're chatting or making a wedding speech, but if you're consulting, let's say, in, in quarter matter like... Uh, writing a business plan, like a confidential business, business plan, right? <laughs> so what happens to that data, or that information? Well, first of all, just like Google, everything you type in, it absorbs it and become part of its training. So in fact, many banks have blanket uh, uh, prohibited uh, the other staff to use officially use ChatGPT because you can inadvertently leak out your business plan when you are discussing GDP and so on. You can just leak out the information without knowing. It. And and secondly, curiously, the quality of ChatGPT is could be deteriorating because now people learn to game the system, and also in the internet. When, when people start using it, they put all kind of opinions, wrong facts in there, and you can't screen them all out. Oh. And it is all part of the training. So, uh, so compared to the pure state, uh, let's say a few years ago, when people put in a lot of information in the internet, and you glean from that and try to answer the questions, nowadays you, you are less and less certain that it could give you an unbiased answer. Now, one other thing is the uh, so-called hallucination. Oh. Uh, tell us about that, yeah. That's, <laughs> Can I ask you a question? You know, when, when we first started using computers, we, sorry, when we were started using computers many decades ago, we had we used to we use the term garbage in, garbage out. Whatever you feed to the computer is what's going to come back. Does that apply to uh, AI as well, because as an example, let's say, if somebody uh, misfed uh, the information about the grapes of wrath, I'm just using that as an example. And now, ChatGPT has that wrong information. Second person goes and asks information about grapes of wrath. Now, are they going to get that crappy information? Totally, but it is statistically weighted. Right, because there are other information too. Now, one thing to important to know about um, ChatGDP, large language model, is that unlike you and me, there's no knowledge base behind it. We go through our education, you know, and we learn some things. So if I sit down and if I tell you now, I come from Mars <laughs> and not London, right, you would kind of think, oh, <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe has a bit too much to drink. Right? <laughs> ChatGDB doesn't have this framework. Exactly. It just said look at the next best word to fit in. Mm -hmm. right. So in fact, recently in June in, in New York there was a famous case. The, the plaintiff the lawyers were presenting a case to, to the judge, and it's all very convincing and beautifully <laughs> written. And in fact, and he presented six case to the judge. And when the clerk looks at it, all of them are fake. They were beautifully produced, very coherent and very convincing, except that they will never happen. It was fiction. So in fact, the sole concern for ChatGDP is to produce a coherent answer 
the, the natural language. It doesn't check on the text or the accuracy. And that is that's what people refer to as hallucination. Hallucinate. And in fact, it is again, if you think about it, because uh, ChatGDP learn from the web. They are giga, uh, terabytes and terabytes of data. And you need to compress them into, let's say, a few billion parameters. It seems a big number, a few billion parameters. But nevertheless, it's compressing ter terabytes and terabytes of data into gigabytes of data. So necessarily, it lose some information. Compression. Okay. So it doesn't have the granularity. And secondly, because what I mentioned about the uh, having introduced some probability in that, because it doesn't want to get stung when it doesn't find exactly the right fit, to introduce some flexibility of, or probability to choose different words, different versions, so that you can keep going to produce a sentence. So as a result, if you choose a slightly wrong word, it could actually set you off in the wrong path. And that is why in the New York case, lawyer case, they produced a very convincing case, but actually it's all fiction. And it is actually baked in, yeah. as, as it is now. And people are looking for ways to get around that. So Gary, when, when you and I were talking earlier about uh, LLMs and, and AI, one of the things that you were very clear about was that AI and LLMs are already a big part of our lives. In fact, I think you mentioned companies like Netflix, Amazon, Alibaba, Fidelity. They're all using to one degree or another and have been for several years these technologies, these techniques. Um, let's, let's zero in on the world of financial services, investment banks, okay? Uh, what tools are currently being used? What AI and uh, ML tools are currently being used? LLMs are currently being used by investment banks today. And what do you see as the trend going forward? Right. How will it accelerate? I assume it's going to accelerate. Here. Yes. Now, currently, the most used, well, there were a few areas. One is customer experience, mm -hmm. right. because uh, you want to customize customer experience. Netflix, um, for example, Netflix uh, introduced um, uh, recommended films to me. They're all Star Trek, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Not because they, they know me personally, but because they can classify me and group me into a similar profile statistically okay. out of, uh, let's say, a few million people that have similar profile with me. So they can predict what my interest will be. Okay. So, in, in the same way, customer experience is the same thing. You, you want to drill down to a bit more granularity for the individual customer, but nevertheless, you learn the general trend, what the customer require, what would they be interested in, what would be the cross-selling opportunities. And, and when customer send an inquiry, you get a rapid response. So this is uh, one area where people use um, AI on this. Another area is developing is on operations. If you think of a financial institution, uh, you have large amount of data going through, let's say, payment system or post trade, trade uh, reconciliations. You have large amount of data coming through, and at the moment, we have a software software engineering mindset. We have, we say, okay, this is what should be followed. And those are the different uh, scenarios that we, we like to anticipate it and try to say, okay, classify it and, and solve the problem. But when systems get more complex and, and get more and more variables get thrown in, it's harder and harder for human to think through all the consequences and permutations. So would risk management be a good example? Yes, uh, exactly. So the... The main point about AI is that it has a much better capacity, much larger capacity to ingest information from disparate sources. And you can classify this, summarize it, and put them into different patterns. And you can start joining the dots to create uh, new insights. And you can summarize the information for your decision making. So as a result, you are more confident 
to make uh, the correct decisions. You're not just guessing, you, you have evidence to support you. So, so risk management would be, let's say, a more complex application for this, but the basic settling, clearing and settling of transactions would be a simpler. Right. Um, now, this is this new field called ML Ops or AI Ops. Basically, when you're doing large operations, you have all the data, the log file going around. And this is very, it's quite difficult for the, uh, the IT personnel to try to digest it. So you rely on the machine to flag it up and so on. But the whole point is when you flag up something, you ignore a lot of information. 90% of the information, the patterns and so on, you, you, you don't see them. They only flag up red flag. So the field of ML Ops is to suck in all this data, look in the pattern, and see what potentially could go wrong. So uh, this is this again. You, you use the term pre predictive analytics, I think. Before. Yes. So this has that capability. You think, down the uh, road. That's right. Because instead of looking at individual event, let's say something happened and raised a red flag, you look at all the, the patterns before it and after, and you yeah. learn from that. And so next time when similar pattern develop. We will try to predict and say, oh, you look out for this. So collateral management might be a good application for this. Uh, in fact, uh, exactly. In fact, many areas when you can get additional insights and information are looking at patterns mm -hmm. would benefit from this sort of analysis. Very interesting. So, okay, we, we have big companies that are using it right now. How can a mid-size or a small company take advantage of this technology, these techniques, today? Yeah. Now, there are actually um, two different aspects. First of all, uh, AI, um, there's a lot of open source AI program. Now. You know, it's, it's, uh, compared to a few years ago, it's no longer only accessible by researcher and people with highly specialist skills. And secondly, with the advance of uh, ChatGPT, large language model, you have a natural language interface to communicate with the AI. So that drives a lot of the development. So we no longer have, uh, have to have the size of Microsoft or Google to make use of AI. So, this is the, the, the main point. And the, the, second, the, the second point is about data. All the, all the company, right. uh, whatever we're working in, it produces internal data and client's data. It has value. It has a, this is where you're looking for patterns. In a smaller scale, it is, but you still, nevertheless, you can actually learn from the client from the client response or, uh, or the purchasing patterns uh, and so on, you can learn a lot to give you more information to adjust your business model. So, so let me ask you a question here. And I know um, many people, go ahead. Yeah, great oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's <laughs> oh, yeah. Where are they? Yes, sir. Nefarious uses of AI, spying on people, insider trading, is that being done? <laughs> uh, I am, I am, well, it's a very fine line. I, I'm sure it will be done somewhere, but basically, when you look for patterns, when you discuss for something, then you say, okay, I'm going to act on this. And it is a very fine line about insider trading. Or not. In a way, you can say it is insider trading, but if you... <laughs> Let's say you, in the old days, you go into a marketplace, you talk to everybody. You don't know who is, uh, you know, some people have more information, but some people just uh, gossiping. You have to make your, up your own mind and build up your own picture. AI is the, uh, allow you to do it at scale in, uh, in, in terms of machines. So you need to have a certain filter and certain metrics to make your, uh, in order to help you to make the right decisions. 
but nevertheless, the tools is there. The catchment area of information is much wider now and much faster. And you would think the regulators would do the same and use AI as well. Right? But Kevin yes. has a question. Go ahead, Kevin. I want to go back to this issue of hallucinations. <clears throat> it's very compelling, it sounds, to use AI tools because of its ability to deal with large data, to deal with speed, identify patterns. But given this risk of hallucination, right, how much work is required to validate the output? And how risky is it that perhaps the recommendations are going to steer your organization right off a cliff? Because they're literally driving while intoxicated, right? They're exactly. driving while under hallucinations. How do you deal with that? <laughs> right. So this goes back to earlier what has been mentioned, garbage in, garbage out. So they are different. So because this is baking, this hallucin hallucination, hallucination, it's baking, because of data compression and because of the probability element to introduce to it. So there, there are different ways that people try to control it. Uh, let's say six months ago, people were talking about prompt engineering. Basically, you try to engineer your question such that it gives you a, a more robust and reliable answer. But now we know that it really doesn't work so well because um, uh, because you 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 are in a very unstable path, prompting, doing exactly the right prompt to get exactly the, the kind of right answer you are looking for is very unstable. So people are start looking for two different things now. One is called RAG. Um, it's called retrieval augmented generation. So basically, what you what they're trying to do is use your own in-house data, use the verified data source, it could be PDF, could be credit reports that you uh, you comfortable with, and use LLM as an interface to assess those data and summarize it and answer things for you. So you restrict it, so you're not going into a marketplace where you hear everybody talking and try to summarize the answer. You only go to your trusted source and get the sum get the summary out from that. So that reduces the, the chance of hallucination. And the second thing is, is more about explainability, is um, because uh, AI thinks differently from human, right? as we discussed before, we have our education, we learn the basic things. You know, we, we all have certain unspoken assumptions. Let's say if I have uh, a we book a coffee with you tomorrow at 11 o'clock. I'm going to be half an hour late. I, I would text you, I say, well, I'm sorry, I'm half an hour late. But AI might think of a different route. AI might think, well, let's engineer a, a traffic jam to slow you down so that you are even later than me. It is the same objective, right? So we, you, I arrive before you, right? <laughs> so AI doesn't necessarily have this um, whole set of assumptions that we share in our education. So it could come up with wacky answer, which still fit in with objectives. So if, in order to control that, people start looking about, oh, how do we as humans organize our knowledge? And it is so-called knowledge graph. So basically, it is like a family tree, except in each node is not a family member, it's certain facts. And so on. So it and connections. So certain facts have certain connection to other facts, and which and other facts were depending on those facts. So you have a network of knowledge that is what is called knowledge graph. So in order, so LL, uh, the chat GTP instead of just pulling out information from the pattern, uh, from the the training, it would try to go through this structure. <coughs> And as you go through the nodes, so when you go through a certain node, then you restrict your answer to only that certain subset of answers, and not the other one. So when, when I established that Derry Wong arrived in, um, in JFK from London, it wouldn't say Gary Wong actually from Mars. Mm -hmm. So it is... Uh, so... This is a problem. Do you think that there will be a large corporate disaster moving down the road? when an organization over-relied 
our AI to do certain activities, like charge customer fees, or you know, there's going to be some big corporate disaster where AI drives a firm off. Do you think that's a realistic possibility, or will these controls and checks that you're talking about be sufficient? I am sure it will be teething problem along the way. I don't know. The question is how far people are willing to let go, you know, to, to use in, in the name of automation and cost efficiency. Uh, because and also that's what the um, uh, what um, the, uh, the other audience mentioned is that the regulator need to look into that and yes. some tightly control it because it's not a free for all. Uh, uh, when we are chatting and social media, you can use ChatGPT. But when you are giving legal opinion, legally fin uh, financial advice that has a certain implication, you need to be much more careful and regulated. Or flying a plane. Or flying a plane. Right. Right. Yes. Jay. I, I just want to get a perspective. Yeah. AI has been there for decades because I used to be a programmer. Right. A programmer, program that program, programs on its own. That's basically what AI is. Yes. Uh, and you, uh, I just want to get a perspective of how has it changed? It was not in the limelight 20, 30 years ago. And now suddenly it's in the limelight. <coughs> Obviously, there's more data available. But what is your perspective on how things have changed to three decades ago versus why it is getting the limelight now? And the second thing you already mentioned about fine tuning, that was amazing. That, that, you know, uh, but people understand AI in the context of the whole world. Now we want to apply AI for a specific purpose, for a specific industry, right? This is what everybody would be interested in. And how do you fine tune that? You have limited amount of data, but you know the program is not programming well on its own. How do you make sure it's going the right direction? Obviously, you can fine tune, and then when it gets to a certain this thing where you can test out all the different scenarios before you even get it public. That's why you validate and then you bring it up, okay, well, fine, now you know, we're going to introduce to the vehicle. So I asked a lot of different questions, perhaps, you know. Yes. But I think this really applies to, you know, the transition from what has happened in old decades versus how we see applying specific. Because everybody understands we had chat GPT. Chat GPT is like, okay, you get some information, you could build a presentation, you could get some information. But now, if you're working in the industry, you want to apply AI to my industry. You don't yes. have enough time to discuss that, but maybe you can give like you know, yes, kind of thing. But just talk about how we yeah, right. talk about it. Yeah. So, um, okay. So to answer your first part of your question, uh, the amount of data we have now compared to let's say 40, 30 years ago are totally different. So you have the possibility to train your model in a much a much more systematic way. And secondly, the, the processing power. You know, the, the Apollo, you know, our washing machine has more processing power than, than the, uh, the Apollo that land on the moon. So again, uh, this, these two factors together uh, drive the AI um, development. To, 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 let's say um, 30 years ago, people still still very interested in linguistic, how to analyze language. But it's more an academic subject. But now it becomes very relevant in terms of how do you, uh, you know, in, in terms of part of the LLM. So the fields keep developing, and I feel that it, we are like um, it was almost like a couple hundred years ago, uh, maybe hundred years ago when they start introducing motor car, but most people were still riding on horses. If we, we will say, okay, electricity is going to be very important, and oil uh, and combustion engine is going to be very important, you can, when you're riding on a horse, to say, okay, I see the electric car, it probably the future is going to be important. But we probably didn't really appreciate how important it is going to be. So I want to make this point because data is the fuel to drive AI engines. And we don't emphasize enough how important data are to, to, to let us um, to make use of AI. So, um, so in fact, one of the missing elements to be able to apply it to our own organization is about organizing the data. 
people pay, in a way, pay lip service to say, okay, we need to organize the data and so on. But a lot of them, I feel, is still on a software engineering mindset. You, you need the data to feed through your process to get an outcome. So data is a cost center. You need to look after it in order to produce the operations and the sum. It's a cost center. So in investment bank, for example, the regulations and uh, fundamental review of trading book, so called FRTP, uh, that requires you to, uh, to feed in a lot of data and standardize it. From, let's say, the commodity desk as a data and certain risk, let's say delta, but interest, interest rate trading desk has other kind of risk metrics. They have the same name, let's say delta sensitivities, but it has a slightly different definition. The equity, the equity <coughs> trading desk, a different one again. So you pull in all this data and they all talk a slightly different languages. So, but then it's a cost center because at the, uh, so people lost motivation to clean it up. Similarly, with investment like uh, value, um, uh, valuation adjustment, so called XVA, is the same thing. You need to calculate the capital usage on your trading book. So you need to combine the data from the different trading desks and so on together. But they all have slightly different definitions. <coughs> so, in, in, and then if you think about in an organization, we have so much other data. We have email communication, PDF, we have legal opinion, we have compliance opinion. All this information are scattered around. We don't really have an efficient way to assess them. Right? So at the moment, they are all cost-centered. You, you, you want, let's say, regulations, so-called PCBS 239, which is a risk data uh, to, to uh, harmonize the risk data and to find the uh, lineage but they are all record, record data, record, record driven and they have no real motivation to clean up. But if you think about from an AI angle, these are going to be the few to fit into the AI engine. And as I said right in the beginning, the different mindset be between software engineering and AI machine learning, how they use data and how you actually get the outcome. Uh, and it's very different. So looking after the data, organizing it, and so on, and in anticipation of the value it's going to give you, is going to be a key part on driving the growth of the organization. Yeah. So, so it's, the, it's the accuracy. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Hi. Hi, Gary. Um, it seems to me that there's a case to be made for the value of human experts combined with AI. So I'm thinking, if I wanted to use it and say I want to understand, I want to do due diligence on a company that's doing mining and understand their environmental and safety impact, I could ask AI that, but then I'm still going to go to a mining expert and say, can you take a look at this and see what might be missing? And that person might say, oh, it's, something was left out because you're in this location, you have mountainous areas, this is going to cause a different impact. So if, if we're smart about it, it seems like we're getting rid of some of the the, the grunt work and, and applying our real expertise in a way that provides value, which we should be doing anyway, but we don't always do. But it, it seems like that would be a great marriage. And I'm wondering if you can comment on that, if that could be totally. the future. Yes. That, that doesn't end up in a no, totally. crash and burn. Really. Yeah, because in a way, AI is a general tool. It, right. And the expert knowledge is... Um, is a very specialized set of knowledge. And it actually, it involves a lot of an ecosystem of knowledge. Right. So, and um, so in fact, this is, human expertise is still required, at least for now, I don't know in about 30 years time, but for now, definitely. AI will play a role of gathering data. You can ingest data from various sources summarize them, categorize them, and start forming dots where you can start joining dots to form new insights. But we probably can't rely on it to give the expert opinion, right? the legal opinion, and, and the mining um, opinion. Um, 
I just wanted to, be, to ask you a question because it seems to me that the most important thing is really the access to the most accurate data. And data is so important. And now, a smaller company is not going to have the resources to get that access. It's going to be a bigger company. So how do you foresee this whole concept? Because the more data you have, the more accurate is your assessment in any way. So how other companies are going to have that access in order to come up with this? Right. How do you see it? Okay. Um, I'm going to start with a slightly different answer okay. to move from the human. Let's say you are VCs or private equities. Right. You invest in 30 companies. Okay. Each of them has data. Right. It, at the moment, you make the decision based on how profitable it's going to be. But each one of them would have their own, have the operational data, have the client data. It might not be at scale. But if you are VCs, you're investing in 30 office firms, there is now a data um, equation in that. Because if you have a certain themes, like ESG, for example, you would say, okay, there's a carbon theme, there's an environmental theme, and you invest in that, based on that. But now it's also potentially an, uh, a data theme, because there could be a gap in there where a certain new company that actually operate in a certain space can actually produce very valuable data to fill in the gaps, where you can get a much more uh, bigger, uh, comprehensive view of the field that you're interested in. And it makes you much more confident in making your decision-making process. So now, uh, going back to what you said, it's, it's about grouping together uh, different things. Now, from the VC, you can group it in a different way. So you start forming certain themes so that you can look at the data size and say, does it add value to, to if I invest in a certain area? Does it, is the data going to add value to my investment decision or the other side? And secondly, data itself become an asset, become valuable. And even you're a small company, you have your own operational data, your client data. Perhaps, potentially, you can barter your data with other, other firms, mm -hmm. upstream supplier, downstream supplier, and other um, exchange of data. Because you, what you want to do is to build up a comprehensive picture of what you're interested in. So first of all, you need to figure out what kind of information is really valuable to you. And then you start looking, oh, there's a gap in here, there's a gap in here. And you start to source it. And instead of paying for it, maybe if you organize your own data well, and, and so that maybe you can start bartering, you have a certain power. Because even if you do not make use of it, you're certain that some other firm using ML, uh, AI or machine learning would be interested in your data if it is well presented, clean, and so on. So it would have some certain value. The question is how do you value that data? Mm -hmm. The one who is providing the data is providing actual data. And then somebody could provide a service. Like you mentioned, you can subscribe to the service and you have all of the data yeah. that you can leverage because you don't have actual data. Right? Is that correct? Yes. That's, that's but correct. the question is how do you value this? So it comes back to blockchain. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. Go ahead, Bob. Aren't you? Gary, uh, we all remember the first five minutes of the original Terminator movie. That did not end well. What are the military applications of AI? Wow. It is uh, outside my field, but I could say that generally it is about getting as much relevant data as you can and make very fast decisions. <clears throat> this will be the relevant area to look at, I suppose, for the military side. So these decisions would be made possibly in milliseconds. I mean, is, is it that fast? It depends on what is the applicable time scale, I suppose. Uh, and also what are the what are you fighting against? 
if your if your opponents make decision in seconds, then milliseconds is great. Right? If your opponents make decision in days, then even five hours is is, is great. Right? But we don't really know how it's going to evolve. But in a way, the world need to be regulated because the AI become open source and every, a lot of people can make use of it. Right? So, and you simply don't know what people are going to make use of it. You know, how do you apply it? So, so one of the great things of work, about working with Gary is, um, I don't have to ask many questions. The audience comes up with questions. <laughs> so, so, so let me interrupt. And yes, sir, please. <laughs> you mentioned AI needs to be regulated. Propose a regulation or two. What do you think would be most important? Well, uh, I really, I I would have to put my hand up and say I don't really know because it is a, a tool. Thing is, the Pandora box is open because it's open source, and also you have a large language model which help people assess it uh, in large scale. Where many pe different people can assess it. So we, in a sense, when you say regulations, it, if you think back a bit, social media, the regulation, we, we do a lot of mental uh, health issues uh, for, for young people, for many people, and we haven't even got around to regulate it yet. So in a way, we, we have started it, but we were behind the curve. In a way, we have to think of what could be the impact, what kind of tools it will be produced, what kind of scenario it, 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 using AI tools can produce, and the regulation will be applying in those areas. Uh, I think that will be the general guideline. I, I don't really have a very uh, detailed answer to this. Because I don't think the regulators know what to do right now. Right? The regulators don't have enough understanding what they want to regulate and how to regulate. It's too early in the game to regulate it. Yes, I think the, the fundamental issue is on the ethical side and the morality side, we haven't caught up with, with a lot of this. We have no guiding principle to help us. So we are all reacting to the new technology and we have no moral or eth ethical framework that can apply all the way there. We have one partial framework so I think a lot of the focus would be to develop this to catch up with the uh, capability that the technology will provide us. We need to live in a way that we feel comfortable with certain guiding principles. So Gary, <laughs> data and computing power. Yeah. Okay, th those are two themes that I think we've all heard here tonight. Um, Data meaning it's got to be complete, it's got to be accurate, okay? And it has to be normalized, as you indicated right. before, okay? You also talked about computing power. And um, so how, how does one approach setting up a cost-effective and flexible data infrastructure to handle this? Because that's really what you're talking about, right? Yes. You've got to have those two elements in place in order to have a successful rollout. So, to, to the young lady's point before, okay, smaller companies, okay, how do smaller companies take advantage of this? How do they approach this? Yeah, right. So, um, one of the easiest way to plug into that is to move in the cloud, because there's a lot of uh, open source code that is accessible to, in the cloud, a lot of analytics, a lot of tools that handle data in the cloud. Now, but the, old, the, the, the thing is, if, when you have your own set of computers, uh, or when you're using the computer in the cloud, they have a very different cost structure. You need to be aware of that, because many people, when, they, when the clouds come out, say, okay, let's move on, let's move into the cloud. It's going to be cost efficient, yes. and I have unlimited, com uh, flexible computing capacity. But it turns out it's just as expensive as before. It just moved to a different value. Because the cost structure of a cloud is... is um, uh, because when we were using our own computer, we have no... We have certain cost constraint, but it is some cost. We can just program it, use it, 
and uh, and then we have uh, transfer data between the machine and so on, and those are already sunk costs. Whereas if we if we apply the same software program into the cloud, um, let's say um, uh, it, it could cost a lot more than we imagine. For example, a pricing function you pass in the U curve, for example. In the old days, U curve may be 20, 30 points. Nowadays, it could be 5,000 points if you have a very good uh, model for pricing. If you put, and if you also pass all the data from the from the tray structure and a lot of the structure, can you move large chunk of data across the cloud? It to cost you an arm and a leg. So this is uh, so you need to be aware of many of these things to optimize your program to work in a, in a, in a different way in the cloud to minimize the cost. So moving in the cloud, you have a lot more tools available. But you need to be aware, you need to change the way you program it to make use of the cloud. And, and Gary, I know you have not read what I'm about to reference, but the Bank of America recently came out with a report on AI, uh, which among other things indicated, stated that there's been a 3,100%, a 3,100% increase in terms of teraflops, okay, um, I, since 2015. So would you say that if that if that is the case, that is certainly one of the factors that's driven this development, okay? It's the computing power, as you say, right? Yes. So what do you think about that trend? Do you have a view on that? Is that trend going to continue? To, to your, your point about cost in the cloud, right? So if, if we continue to see these types of uh, uh, improvements, or will we, I should say? Is, that's my question to you. What do you think? Okay, um, let me again I start from a different answer and move back towards you. Okay, one of, let's say I, I choose two and, and, and we have four minutes left. Okay. <laughs> I need to speed up my uh, <laughs> two benchmark Ant Financial in China and Bank of America. Yes, Ant Financial have less than 17,000 staff. But it has 700 million users, monthly users, and you have a big range of products being offered. Bank of America have 217,000 staff, and it has 68 million clients, customers, and only a much more smaller subset of products they can offer. So this is the room of, because N Financial is they build from the ground up. They also have big internal market like in the US, but it builds from the ground up. So it gives you some indication of what the, the headroom is if you want to move down this path. I'm not saying to say so, so, so where where major disruptions will continue to occur in the future. Oh, totally. So, yeah, so it's a great investment opportunities when you find the right areas yes. that, that it hold the, the bottlenecks that they're holding back on all these changes. Yes, yes. So Gary, in the closing moments that we have here, uh, what are the parting thoughts that you'd like to offer out to the audience? I think... like What's the future look like? What, like what you get said, you know, in the in the near term, we are a bit disappointed how slow things are, but if you look at the five ten year horizon, you will be very surprised how fast things will move. So I think we feel I think that we are like um, we are riding on horseback and we see some motor car being on the road. We kind of can feel that we imagine some things could happen, but we probably still caught us by, caught us by surprise how fundamental and how big the change will be. Uh, because you have a huge substantial advantage if you have a good information flow yes. and the model, an operation model that allow very flexible business arrangement, keep changing and, and so on. It will give you such a huge cost advantage you cannot ignore. It. Yes. And on that note, Gary Wong, PhD of Artemis Limited uh, from London. Thank you so much. Okay, um, I'm going to turn it over to you.
Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Bob, for moderating. This was an amazing discussion. Um, Bob, I can tell you, my wife wrote my daughter Sweet 16 on ChatGPT this morning. <laughs> so, you're know, not the only one writing speeches. Yes. <laughs> It's, you know, if you think about the application, I'm it's... sure they'll all be impressed. Yeah, right. But mm -hmm. well, she started crying after she read it. <laughs> like, what are you getting in this one? She's like, oh, I'm reading all this stuff. It applies to my daughter. It was hilarious just this morning. Um, but yeah, that's the that's the future, and I think the applications are unlimited. I think there's a lot of potential and also disadvantages. Like you said. You don't know where it's going to land, but I can't wait for the SEC to use ChatGPT <laughs> to regulate those, those insider trades that Bob was talking about. Uh, but thank you everyone for coming. Please stay back for networking. We have some food and drinks here. Our, uh, the Roundtable is a nonprofit dedicated to industry best practices in education. Again, those who are guests here, sign up, become members. Our code is right here. Um, you know, our next month's event is on November 29th. It is a discussion on private equity and private markets panel where we will have Cheryl Schwartz and Adam Weinstein as the speakers and we're still working on a moderator. Uh, so please look out for more information on that and uh, thank you everyone for being here today.